Em nghĩ mình bắt đầu luôn được ở Kim. Dạ ok anh. Ok, we can start uh, the class. Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome back to our life science spin-off workshop program. Tonight uh, or this this morning, I'm going to talk about deal terms. And uh, before uh, I launch into detailed discussion about deal terms, I want to talk about exit strategies because the exit strategy is the uh, very important step before we actually get to discussing deal terms with investors and it also has uh, some impact on the specific terms of our deal so let's uh, we'll begin with exit strategies which i also feel it's a, a widely misunderstood concept so i'll hope to clarify some important misunderstandings you might have about exit strategies in this morning session. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, as always, uh, feel free to jump in with questions or comments in either in the chat or uh, verbally if you have something you would like clarification on or something you would like to share. Okay, so before uh, we get to deal terms in detail, uh, we, let's look at some background to deal terms. First, exit strategy. Why is exit strategy so important? This gets back to how investors in our company make money. And we touched on this topic in the last class when we talked about valuation. The valuation of the company is perfectly correlated with the valuation of the company at exit. So the current valuation of the company is actually a function of the company's valuation at the exit. Of course, if there is no valuation if there is no exit there's no valuation at exit so if the company is not going to exit then there won't be any valuation at exit and if there's no valuation at exit then there's no meaningful uh, current valuation so this is how exit strategy links back to deal terms the first uh, and most important and most often discussed and most difficult to negotiate deal term in most cases is the valuation. So why is that? Last class we looked at methods of uh, estimating or formulating valuations. Um, oh, okay, wait, I heard, I hear we have a question from a student. Yeah, uh, I think the questions is related to our last sessions um, on Monday about the evaluations. Uh, so the questions is uh, why do high or over valuation than the numbers you uh, mentioned in our class? And uh, if the other VCs uses the same formula, so why do they have over valuation compared to the numbers you given the last uh, session? So the, the question is about evaluation, right? Yeah, correct. Um, okay. And what was the specifically about evaluation? Um, I, mean, uh, I think the question is related to other uh, VC investors, they value over uh, or high compared to the numbers uh, we given in last session. Uh, so yeah, some, so the yeah, question is, uh, why they forgot to mute that's why 
Em có chữ chữ à, Anh Vương anh mute dùm em Rác này là đang ghi âm Đang ghi à, Ok So wait, was that related to that, this question? Uh, no, I think she forgot to mute. Oh, okay. So, so the, I think the question is, why do some investors overvalue startups? And yeah, is that right? Uh, yeah, correct. So, okay. So there's two types of investors in startups. We call these two types of investors uh, smart money and dumb money. Smart money investors are investors who know how to do venture, know how to correctly structure and price venture capital deals. Dumb money investors are investors who don't necessarily know how to structure and value startup company deals. Now, just to be clear, I know dumb money sounds bad. You know, it sounds uh, rude or it sounds, um, uh, you know, condescending or dismissive toward those investors, but that's not what it means. It, it, it's, it, it, I know it sounds like that, but it's not intended to mean that. Dumb money investors are not dumb. They're not dumb people. Uh, they might not even be dumb investors. They're just not, uh, uh, skilled at doing venture capital investment. So that's the key point. Uh, a lot of dumb money investors are very good investors in other types of investment. So maybe they're successful real estate investors or a successful um, public uh, company equity investor. So they're, they might be very skilled at some form of investment. But I hope that one of the things that you're learning from our program is investment in startups is very different from other types of investment. And when investors, uh, let's say, who are new to venture capital or uh, new to investing or investors who come to venture capital investment from another investment uh, asset class, they, they can make very big mistakes in structuring and pricing their venture capital deals. So uh, one of these mistakes is overvaluing startups. And I'm, uh, I feel pretty sure that a lot of overvalued startup deals are done by dumb money investors who don't know how to properly price a startup deal. Now, that's, that's one common reason. Another reason that we might see uh, overvalued startup, and this is uh, actually more interesting reason and I think something uh, important to discuss. When, when we looked at the valuation methods in the last class. What, uh, what are valuation methods or what do we actually arrive at when we use valuation methods? Uh, we arrive at a valuate, what I would call a valuation position, meaning the reason that an entrepreneur does a valuation of their startup, like the one we discussed in last week's class, uh, last class, or the reason and the reason why an investor does a valuation of a startup. Why? Why do they do that? Is it to arrive at the valuation valuation truth of this company? Meaning, is this supposed to be the true valuation of the company? And um, now, of course, if each does the rigorous valuation, like we talked about last time, and they come to different conclusions because they make different assumptions, then we could have two different valuations coming out of the exact same valuation method because assumptions are different. So what does that tell us about the valuations that are the result of that process? Are they, are they the valuation truth? They can't be the valuation truth because if two um, sides or two people are using the exact same methods, just making different assumptions and coming out uh, at the end of that process with two different valuations, then neither one is obviously the truth. So the, the point here is there's no true valuation of a startup company or any company for that matter. Valuation, it's a matter of opinion. And the valuations that we derive when we use the valuation methods that we talked about are, typically used as a 
foundation for the negotiating position of entrepreneur and investor in uh, investment negotiation. That's what those valuations mean. So the uh, startup will have a valuation that they've derived using valuation methods that underlies their opening valuation position. And the investors will have a valuation they derive that uh, underlies their opening uh, valuation negotiating position. But, but what ultimately determines the real valuation? So if you think about it this way, you know, what is the, what is the real or true valuation of a startup or any company? The real or true valuation of a company or startup is different from the calculated valuations that we learned about in last class. Because why? There's two ways to value companies, or there's two, uh, there are two uh, schools of thought on valuation. The first school of thought on valuation is called a fundamental valuation. Fundamental valuation assumes that there is a fair market value or true value for a company, and we try to find it using the types of um, mathematical methods and formulas that we uh, learned about in the last class. So that's a fundamental valuation. The idea is we can value companies using uh, different valuation models, and we can arrive at the current valuation for the company. The way that that information is usually used is now I can decide whether to invest or not because I can see whether fundamental valuation differs from market valuation. That's how most uh, analysts use these valuation methods uh, to make investment decisions. So we calculate the, the fair market valuation using standard valuation methods, and then we compare the results of that analysis to the market valuation of the company. And we can decide if the company is currently underpriced or overpriced, and then we can decide whether we want to buy it or sell it. The second method of valuation is called technical valuation. Technical valuation means the value, the, there is no uh, fair market value of the company separate from the market valuation. So in technical valuation approach, the valuation of the company is whatever the maximum price that someone is willing to pay for that company or has actually paid for that company. So when you look at uh, application of technical valuation methods to public companies, technical traders or technical analysts, they watch the prices um, and they use uh, different types of analytical methods to determine if the price is gonna go up or down. But uh, basically, uh, if you think about technical valuation, it says that the value of a company is determined by the investor sentiment. So if an investor is willing to give you a valuation 3 million, that's the value of your company. It doesn't matter what the DCF model says, what the comparable method says, what the VC method says. If an investor is willing to give you 10 million, that's the value of your company. Doesn't matter what any uh, fundamental model says. So in fact, that's how real valuation is ultimately determined. So real valuation is ultimately determined by what is the maximum valuation that someone is willing to give you for your company. Um, that's determined through negotiation. So that's why I, Started out by started out this answer by pointing to the the use that we will put the valuations that we learned about in the previous lesson uh, to arrive at the final valuation. What we do is we will uh, use the valuations that we calculated to inform our negotiating position, but in the end, the valuation will be the result of negotiation. So. That should also tell us why our valuations in the market sometimes very different from the ones we calculate when we use standard valuation formulas. The reason is valuation is determined through negotiation 
and valuation is a price. During a price negotiation, what determines the final price is the supply and demand of whatever uh, price is being, uh, whatever the underlying asset uh, of the, that subject of the price negotiation is. So if there's more demand than there is supply for that asset, then the price will be high. If there's more supply than there is demand, then the price will be low. Since we're talking about valuation here, we can uh, understand that when we see, let's say when we see very high valuations uh, relative to what are the, um, what is the expected valuation given our standard valuation methods that this valuation came out of a negotiation where there was a lot of demand to invest in this startup, which for your purpose means there's more than one interested and motivated investor and they're competing with one another to invest in your startup. So in the case where there's, for example, in the case where there's only one interested investor, then the valuation of the startup, okay, let's say in the case where there's one interested smart money investor, then the valuation for the startup will tend to be pretty close to the fundamental valuation that we talked about in last class. In the case where there are multiple investors interested in this company and they're competing with each other to invest in the company, that creates more demand for the company's equity. And that means that the price of that equity is gonna go up, which means valuation is gonna go up. So when we see, when we see valuations that are uh, obviously out of line on the high side with the, the valuation that we would get for this company using a fundamental valuation method, nor, uh, typically we can, assume that there's one of two reasons. One is dumb money investor. Two is competition between multiple investors who bid up the valuation of this company during the investment negotiations. Now for me, I, I don't like to, I, I won't participate in investment um, auctions like that where the, price gets bid up because there's multiple interested investors. For me, I would rather I would rather not invest in a company that's overvalued in a negotiation like that uh, because I feel like how do you win an auction like that? You know, like you win it, it, you, you know, you so-called win the auction when you overpay. So, I don't feel like overpaying means that I won. Because even if the uh, you get the deal, but you know the investor got the deal, but you overpaid for the deal, this means that um, you're not going to make the required return on this investment. So, so this is why, uh, in my experience, these are why we uh, what underlies the situation where we see overvalued startups: one, dumb money investor; two, uh, multiple interested investors who bid up the price. So, okay, then next question that I would like to answer about that. So is it, uh, is it good for startups to be overvalued? Isn't it okay? Like, let's say we do have, let's say situation one, you know, we have a dumb money investor who is willing to way overvalue our startup. Why not? Because let's say uh, example, you know, fair, Let's, uh, in the case where, for example, I would say the company fair valuation is 2.5 million. Uh, so, and we're raising 250,000. So we would give up 10%. But what if we find another investor that's willing to value us at 25 million? So we could take that, you know, either we could take that same 250,000 for 1% or for that same 10%, we could raise 2.5 million. So isn't it great? Why not? Like 25 million versus 2.5 million. Let's go for it. And either we get a lot more uh, money for the same amount of equity, or we can give up a tiny fraction of the equity for the same amount of money. So isn't that all good? Like, should we not worry about overvaluation in that case? Why not just 
take the money at an over, uh, overvaluation. Good, smart or not smart? I think not smart. Um, I think it, it can feel very satisfying, of course, when you close that deal, because you think, wow, I, I really won here. You know, I won in this deal because I got the dumb money investor to give me uh, either a ton of money for uh, the same equity that a smart money investor would have given me uh, much less money for, or I gave up much less equity. So I win. But again, I, I don't consider, I, I don't believe that you, the startup actually won in that situation uh, by getting a ridiculously overvalued. Why, why didn't this, why do I believe the startup didn't win? The reason I believe they didn't win is this is not the end of the game. If this was the end of the game, like if you were selling your company, let's say you're selling your company for way too high, for way overvalued. So instead of raising money for your company, let's say you're trying to sell your company and a fair valuation to sell it is 2.5 million, but you're able to find somebody to buy it for 25 million. And, and let's say they're gonna buy 100% of the company. And let's say there's the, they don't have any, uh, there's no misrepresentations that you made or any reason that later they can try to get back that money you know, after the investment is done, after the sale is done. So you're perfectly, fully disclose everything about the company. They have full information, no misrepresentation, but still they want to, they, for whatever reason, they want to pay 10 times what it's worth to buy. In that case, great, do it. I would, I would, uh, I would you know, take that money and run uh, because that was a great deal. But that's not how investment works. This is a uh, when we talk about overvaluation for investment, it's very different than overvaluation for sale. In fact, you know, we in some way we strive for overvaluation at sale. So if you can, I would say, when you go to sell your company, you always want the maximum possible price. You want to sell a maximum possible price, no matter what, as long as you've been, you know, fully disclosed uh, the relevant information, material information about the company. But investment round, it's not like that. Because why? This is not the last round you're going to do. The last round you're going to do is when you sell the company. If you're in an investment round, there are future rounds to follow before you get to exit. And if you were overvalued in one of those previous rounds before you get to exit, this can have serious consequences for you uh, as a founder and majority shareholder or major shareholder, because uh, why? There are a lot of bad things that can happen to overvalued startups when they cease to be overvalued. So what I, uh, I usually tell entrepreneurs about overvaluation, overvaluation is okay until it isn't okay. That's why at the exit, it's okay because there's no more until. But if you're overvalued in a round before investment, uh, before exit, you're going to have to face future rounds. And when you go into future rounds overvalued in a previous round, you're facing a very difficult situation. Why? Overvalued in the last round, what happens when you meet an investor or when investors are no longer willing to overvalue you? Overvalue you. So uh, now you're going to have a a terrible hangover. You know, the, the overvaluation, it's like a party where you drank way too much and you're so happy and you know everything looks great because you're drunk. But what happens the next day? Now you got to pay, you know, very, now you have to go to work and you have very painful hangover. And that's what your overvaluation is going to be like when you get to the next round. Maybe it felt good in the last round, but what happens in the case I just described? So the company was fair valuation, 2.5 million. They got the dumb money investor to come in at 25 million. Now they, they, they burn through the money they got in that round. They need to raise the next round. So if the first round reasonable valuation was 2.5 and then the next round, let's say reasonable valuation 
We'll even say, let's say the company's super successful and we'll even give them 10 million next round valuation, fair valuation. But the problem is when they go out to raise the next round, they can't value at 10 anymore because last round they were valued at 25. And 10 is what's called a huge down round to the previous uh, uh, round. Down round is very bad for the company, very bad for shareholders, and especially bad for founder shareholders. Because why? One is uh, the, the investor that overvalued the company in last round, they're not gonna wanna see the company raise the next round at a huge discount to what they paid. Uh, so they may block the next round. Uh, oftentimes, venture capital investors will have a veto over next round fundraising. So if, uh, if the company is raising the next round at less than half the valuation that we paid, you can uh, be pretty sure that uh, investors not uh, going to be eager to do that deal and may even block. Um, and anti-dilution. If you do a next round in a big down round, everybody's going to be diluted a lot. And the uh, brunt of the dilution will often fall on the founders because if the investor who way overvalued the company was not totally stupid, they probably put an anti-dilution clause into the investment terms. And we'll discuss anti-dilution clauses later in this morning's class uh, when we get to detailed deal terms. So another possibility is uh, also if the investors weren't stupid and they overvalued the company, they probably included a liquidation preference, which again, uh, we'll talk about later in this morning's class. If they included a liquidation preference, this means because the company was so overvalued in a previous round, it's possible that uh, when, and becomes much more likely that when the company is ultimately sold, the founders will receive a lot less money than they would have received if they hadn't overvalued. And in some extreme cases, they might even receive zero. So these are uh, a few of the really bad things that can happen to you if you're overvalued in an investment round. Uh, this is why uh, overvaluations do happen and why uh, you should try to avoid getting overvalued uh, if possible. Now, get a, a good or high valuation is not bad. You know, in every, um, for every startup, there's a range of possible valuations that they could get investment at. So um, definitely, uh, I fully believe that startups should get the maximum reasonable valuation that they can get, but uh, not more than that. Okay, so hope that clears up a little bit about why we might find valuations in the market that are very different from some of the valuations that we calculated. And I hope that that helps you understand uh, how valuation calculations feed into valuation negotiations and also uh, why it's not in the startup's best interest to get way overvalued. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, valuation is perfectly positively correlated with exit valuation. So the exit valuation um, def basically determines what is the fair current valuation. And if there's no exit, no, there's no return. And if there's no return, there's no ROI. And if there's no ROI, there's no meaningful valuation. So every startup should have an exit strategy. And they're really, it's not that difficult to have an exit strategy because there's really only two meaningful exit strategies, IPO and trade sale. And what does it mean is that there are only two ways for startups uh, to generate returns for investors through listing the company in a uh, stock exchange or through uh, selling the company to another company. So these are the two 
exit strategies that every startup should be targeting when they raise money, IPO or trade sell. So we talked about this in the last class, just to remind the two numbers that basically determine the VC's ROI are exit valuation and current valuation. Now, when I talk to uh, entrepreneurs about exit strategy, I get a lot of wrong responses to what is your exit strategy. Like, I wonder, you know, I, I'm, I wonder how many of us in our class have thought about their exit strategy or have already formulated an exit strategy before going to investors. So I think it maybe, you know, a lot of us haven't done. So uh, these are some of the most common mistakes that I see entrepreneurs make when talking about their exit strategy. So they say, it's too early to think about exit. Um, exit so far in the future, how can we possibly know when we're gonna exit? We don't wanna think about exit. We just wanna build great products. Uh, we don't wanna exit. We're in this to build a successful company for the long run. Um, and one of my personal favorites, Steve Jobs said, you should not start a company with an exit strategy. So these are all, these are all wrong. They are not only wrong, but they're, they should be for most investors. Uh, if investors know what they're doing, these should be negotiation ending comments from the entrepreneur. Meaning once, it, once we hear this from an entrepreneur, uh, and if the entrepreneur is serious about this, then this means um, this means we shouldn't invest in the company. Oh, we have another question from the students. Okay. So um, this question, it's again about valuation. So I'm glad everybody's so excited about valuation. And it seems like it, people did pay close attention in last class, uh, which is uh, I'm happy to hear. So question is, how many times should we jump on the valuation at each round? So I think what this means is the, um, the how much should valuation increase from one round to the next? And I, I, I would say, I would answer this by saying, there's no, uh, there's no strict uh, one size fits all answer to this question. The, of course, we want to increase the valuation round to round. If we're on the company side, we want to increase the valuation round to round as much as possible um, because the higher valuation, the better deal we get, assuming the valuation is uh, still within the reasonable range. So uh, there's not a set multiple of valuation that we should increase every round. What we usually we would do is we calculate the valuation uh, again, based on whatever information we have at the time that we're raising that next round. Uh, so if we do the new valuation for the company with uh, today is day one, instead of last round valuation where uh, you know 18 or 12 months ago was day one, uh, we can do the repeat the exact same process uh, with the valuation methods that we have to arrive at the new valuation. Now it is, but it is a good point that investors will often anchor on the last round valuation as a, a important, at least starting point for valuation negotiation. So that gives us a important insight into what we should be doing every time we raise money. Every time we raise money, we should be using that money to drive growth because the growth in between rounds is gonna have a pretty big impact on the valuation in the next round. How does that work? Um, let's say in, uh, let's say since the last round, we have doubled our revenue. So if, uh, 
I want to make an argument as a startup about what our current valuation should be. Now, assuming that we had a fair valuation in the last round, that's another reason why, uh, this is another reason why crazy valuations don't help us because let's say we doubled, we doubled revenue since the last round, but the last round valuation was crazy. So if, if I'm negotiating with the startup now and they say, okay, last round valuation was 25 million, we doubled revenue and therefore we should be valued now at 50 million. But let's say the last round valuation, reasonable valuation was 2.5. So I would say, good, great. I mean, you know, the fact that your last round valuation was crazy doesn't mean that this round valuation should also be crazy. Uh, on the other hand, if your last round valuation was reasonable, let's say it was 2.5 and you doubled revenue since then, then arguing for a 5 million valuation right now is very strong case for you because you can say, you know, we both agree last round valuation was reasonable. The company has doubled revenue since then. So doubling our valuation seems very fair and reasonable. Um, if revenue was up five times, then increasing valuation five times versus the last round also is not, uh, ne not necessarily unreasonable. So I would say there's, there's no one uh, multiple that we can expect in between rounds, but we typically would, uh, we typically would uh, expect investors to anchor on last round and look for how much has the company grown since then. So this is a good uh, also illustration why it's so important to use your investment rounds effectively, because let's say that you you get the value, you get the investment, and then revenue is flat or number. And let's not overfocus on revenue. So let's say your valuation is not. Uh, mainly revenue driven, let's say it's user driven, uh, or, um, or let's say it's regulatory approval driven. So if you have whatever milestones uh, or metrics you have, uh, milestones you've accomplished or metrics that you've improved uh, on since the last round, you can use to justify your next round valuation. If you, if you haven't, uh, improve metrics or you haven't accomplished any milestones uh, since the last round, then it's going to be pretty difficult for you to argue why uh, you uh, are why we should be valuing the company more highly in this round than it was valued in the last round. And I, I sometimes uh, like to describe this situation to entrepreneurs uh, this way. In the first round of investment, you're usually valued based on the the dream, meaning you're, you're selling the dream to investors, finding investors who share your vision for the company and believe that although the company doesn't have much in the way of real results or metrics so far, uh, it still has a lot of potential. And the potential, like all potential is in the future, but we should get some significant credit for that now in our valuation. But in the second round uh, or future rounds, we can't be, or we don't wanna be selling the dream a second time. In the next round and subsequent rounds, we're selling results and de uh, demonstrated traction. So it's really important if you wanna get a good valuation in the next round to make sure that you accomplish uh, what as uh, as much or even more than you set out to accomplish with the last round funding. Okay, so thanks for those questions. Um, now, moving back to exit strategy. So all of these answers are wrong because we should be uh, thinking about exit strategy from the beginning. Um, it's never too early to think about exit strategy. And when you have an exit strategy, it's not the same as knowing how you're going to exit. Uh, strategies are not about what we know. Strategies uh, about the future, because we don't know anything about the future. Strategies are about how we plan to build that future. So definitely want to have exit strategy from day one. Um, and 
just want to build great products and create a great company. Yeah, that's what we all want to do. Uh, we're expecting you to do that. You want to do that. Um, but you shouldn't do that without thinking about exit because building great products that customers love in a great company that we can never exit still doesn't generate any returns for us. Um, and then don't want to exit. You know, we want to be in this company for long term. I can totally respect that. But then you shouldn't bring in equity investors who want to make money in the less than long term, meaning five to 10 years. If you, you know, if you want to just stay in this company forever uh, and not IPO or not trade sell, that's perfectly legitimate and reasonable goal for you to have. But then you need to do that with your own money, not with investors' money. Then do with your own money, borrow money and pay it back, get it from friends and family that don't care about returns, you're all set. But you can't you can combine these two. Uh, we don't want to exit, but we want investors. And then the last one about Steve Jobs, um, I think uh, as far as I can tell from my research, it, Steve Jobs actually did say this, but I believe that it's taken out of context if it's used as an argument not to have an exit strategy. I think the key thing here is, the key point he's trying to make is, you should not start a company just to exit. That's not how you create returns for investors. Uh, exit, it's not a get rich quick scheme. Exit is a long-term strategy to sell successful companies for a lot of money. And that's what Jobs did throughout his entire career. He, he either provided an exit, uh, he uh, provided an exit for every one of his successful companies to his investors. So uh, exit strategy boils down to trade sale or IPO. Um, then some more detail is very useful. So which one do we want to do? Are we going to do trade sale or IPO? And if we're going to do a trade sale, what kind of company is going to buy us? When will they buy? For how much? And examples of some comparable transactions. Um, now, again, this is not a prediction. We're not saying who's going to buy us when for how much. This is a strategy. We're targeting to get this type of company to buy us for about this much in about this uh, amount of time. And here's some examples that show why that's a reasonable strategy. And then if IPO, where, when, and at what value? So we're gonna list on what exchange, when are we targeting to list, and how much do we think we'll be able to list for? Again, not predictions, but targets. So how to do that exit valuation, um, we do five-year revenue forecast, which we already have in our pro forma model. We can then take our year five revenue, multiply by a sector revenue multiple for acquisitions, avoiding outliers. So some sort of average or you know, mean or 75th percentile or at least the uh, justifiable um, basket of uh, acquisition multiples. And then that'll give us our exit valuation. So example, our five-year revenue forecast tells us that we'll have 100 million revenue in year five. Our sector, in, in our sector, companies are typically acquired at uh, five times revenue. That means our likely exit valuation is $500 million. This is what this looks like in real life. So if we look at, um, different exchanges and the median valuation of the companies uh, at different exchanges, also including m and in here, uh, this is as of 2019, then we see how does that link to current valuation? So next point I wanna talk about in our deal terms is ROI and dilution. So um, is a, are, is dilution a good thing? A lot of times uh, entrepreneurs think dilution is a bad thing, but actually dilution is not a bad thing. Um, excessive dilution is a bad thing, meaning if the investors, if the shareholders, including founders, are over diluted, that's wrong, that's a bad thing. But normal dilution is actually a good thing because normal dilution is what 
uh, happens during the normal growth of venture funded companies. You know, when we go through our fundraising process uh, and funding process, and we raise money uh, every step of the way, uh, meaning we do our seed round, uh, series A, series B, series C, um, as we raise these venture funding rounds, we're gonna get diluted. Everybody in our shareholding cap table is gonna get diluted. This is not bad. This is a uh, expected consequence of fundraising. As long as the company raises each subsequent round of funding at a higher valuation than they did in the previous round, the dilution that shareholders incur will not result in a reduction of value for those shareholders, but instead will result in an increase in value for those shareholders. Why? Dilution means to make something less concentrated. Uh, in our case, what it makes less concentrated is the shareholding of our company. So as we raise money, we sell more equity, and we issue new shares and sell more equity. As we issue new shares and sell more equity, the equity in the company is split by more shareholders, uh, across more shareholders. And as that happens, the percentage of our company that is owned by an existing shareholder goes down when we bring in a new shareholder. So that's what dilution means. But the reason that's not bad, or that should not be bad, assuming we're raising at higher and higher valuation. As a shareholder in a company, what do I really care about? I don't really care about what percentage of the company I own per se. I care about how much is that percentage worth? So if I own, for example, 10% of a company that's worth a million dollars uh, versus 1% of a company that's worth a billion dollars, the 1% is worth a lot more than the 10%. So what I care about is not the percentage of the company I own, but how much is that percentage worth? Uh, how much can I sell that percentage for? So as I get diluted in a venture funded company that's raising multiple funding rounds, as long as the value of my shares are going up every round, I don't care about the dilution. In fact, I welcome that dilution because I understand that without that dilution, the value of my shares would not be going up. So in this, in this case, we can, uh, we can see how that works. Example, uh, the founders put in $100,000 into the company at the beginning and got in exchange for that 100% of the shares. Then in the seed round, they brought in an investor who put $500,000 into the company at a 2 million pre-money valuation, which means a 2.5 million post-money valuation. So the seed investor received 20% of the company in that round. Now, this means that the founder shares, the founder's uh, stake in the company decreased from 100% to 80%. They gave up 20%. Now, is that a, a good thing or bad thing for them? This is actually a very good thing for them. Why? Because if we look at the table at the bottom, uh, we can see that the founder's share in the company after the seed round is worth uh, $2 million instead of the $100,000 it was originally worth. Why? Originally, they put $100,000 in the company. They own 100% of that. Uh, that company was valued in their round at $100,000. When the seed investor comes in and invests at a $2.5 million post money valuation. So now the founders own 80% of a company that's valued at 2.5 million, which is worth 2 million. So the value of their investment, a $100,000 investment went to $2 million when this investment took place. And that's a post dilution. So post-dilution, their 
stake in the company has increased in value 20 times from 100,000 to $2 million. So that's a great result for any investment. And some people, when we talk about this, uh, they say, yeah, but that's just the, uh, that's not real value for the founders. That's just paper value. And I understand what they're trying to say, what they mean when they say that, but it's a misunderstanding of how share valuations work. All share valuations are paper value. Um, if you think about this valuation in the context of the two schools of valuation that we talked about before, uh, fundamental and um, technical valuation, this is a pure technical valuation. The last round investor valued the company at 2.5 million. Therefore, the company is really worth 2.5 million. And it's really worth 2.5 million in the same sense that any company is worth anything because all real valuations are determined by the last transaction value in the stock of this company. And the last transaction value for this company was 2.5 million. Therefore, it's really worth 2.5 million. And therefore the founder shares are really worth 2 million. So the don't be fooled by this uh, distinction between paper value and real value. That's not meaningful in the context of a discussion about the value of our shares. Now, what is fair to say though is, and I think maybe this is what people who are saying it's only paper value are trying to say is that it is fair to say that although our shares are really valued at 2 million, but they're valued at 2 million in a highly illiquid market. So when, for example, Google shares are valued at a certain price in a public market, they're also highly liquid. So we're using the same valuation mechanism, which is what was the last share price. But in addition to that valuation mechanism, we have what's called a lot of liquidity in that market. So you can always pretty much sell your Google shares at the last, at some, uh, spread to the last quoted price. But for uh, startup shares, it's not like that. So it's fair to say that we have shares worth 2 million. However, it's in a highly illiquid market. So very difficult to realize that 2 million today. Okay. Uh, and you can see one more example of why dilution is a good thing when we look at Series A here. So in Series A, the new investor comes in with $1 million and at a pre-money pre valuation of 4 million, which means that this new investor also gets 20% of the company. So where does that 20% come from? The 20% comes from the seed investor and the founder. So seed investors own 20% of the company before Series A. The Series A investor gets 20% of their 20%. And they, uh, founders owned 80% of the company before Series A, and the Series A investor gets 20% of the founders 80%, which is 16%. When we add 16% and 4%, we get 20%, which is exactly equal to the stake that the Series A investor gets. And are the seed investor and the founders happy? Again, they should be happy. Why? because the uh, founders, although they've been diluted by an additional 16%, so founders now own 64% of the company, but the company is valued at 5 million. So this 64% uh, is worth 3.2 million. And remember that after the seed round, their equity was worth uh, 2 million. So now 2 million has grown to 3.2 million. The seed investor has a similar uh, result. So their 20%, uh, which was valued at, uh, uh, which was valued at uh, 500,000 when they invested has now grown to be valued at 800,000. So they also see an increase in value. So this is why um, dilution is a good thing rather than a bad thing, as long as valuation is going up. Because as long as valuation is going up, this means that company's equity pie 
is getting bigger. As long as the company's equity pie is getting bigger, the value of the same size, uh, same size or even smaller slice of that pie can be worth more, will be worth more than it was uh, before the dilution occurred. Okay, so we looked at different exit strategies, uh, trade sell IPO, which is the best. Now, I think for most entrepreneurs, or at least most entrepreneurs that I talk to about exit strategy, uh, the first time their goal for exit is IPO. So they wanna, they want to be in uh, some picture like this. You know, they want to be uh, celebrating at the on the floor of the stock exchange, Nasdaq or New York Stock Exchange. They want to be ringing the opening bell. Um, they did a successful IPO, and they're now now the founder is CEO of a publicly traded company. So that's your. I would say this is your myth of startup success: is we IPO the company. Reality of startup success is we sell the company to somebody else. Uh, we sell the company to a typically much larger company that's in the same uh, sector as us or similar or adjacent sector. And this is borne out by numbers. That's why I say IPO, although it's real, uh, the, the IPO success is limited to a very, very small number of startups. Now, when you when you look at this graph, you have to remember that if you go back and remember the pie chart we looked at in an earlier class, this uh, represents this graph represents only uh, startups that exited, which is twenty five percent of startups that raise venture funding. So we're already looking at three quarters of startups never get to this of the the. 25% of startups that are making it here, uh, the vast majority, 90% are trade sales. Uh, you can see that in the acquisition bar because trade sale is the other side of an M&A transaction. You probably have, you might've heard of M&A, uh, maybe you heard of trade sale or not, but M&A means one company buys another company. When, when, the, when we look at that transaction from the, perspective of the buyer, it's called an acquisition. When we look at that transaction from the perspective of the seller, we call it trade sell. And that's that's what we are. We're a seller in this market. So we're looking at trade sale exit. And if you think about it this way, if 90% if of venture funded exits are trade sales, this means you are, uh, you are much more likely, nine to 10 times as likely to exit in a trade sale as you are to exit in an IPO. And these numbers are from the US and the US has the highest number of venture funded IPOs every year. So if you think about this uh, distribution of exits for Southeast Asia based companies, it's going to be even more shifted toward trade sale. And now on the other hand, if you're a Southeast Asia startup thinking about exit strategy today, you're looking at exit probably five to 10 years down the road. Um, it's certainly possible. And I would personally uh, say somewhat likely that we will see more exits of venture funded companies uh, in Southeast Asia five to 10 years from now. But I think this is still uh, this is still a pretty fair uh, picture of what our likely exit is going to be for uh, Southeast Asia venture funded startup. Uh, if we make it to an exit, we're probably going to have a trade sale. And if you look at the value of these trade sales, um, you notice in a lot of my examples, I have referred to a hundred million dollar exit valuation. And that's not just coincidence. The reason I, I think about, uh, I often use 100 million as exit valuation is that as of 2019, the median valuation for uh, trade sale exit was uh, 
around US $100 million. And if we look at the big returns to IPO exits, they're mostly driven by US IPOs and specifically on NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange. So when you look at um, the valuations of uh, startup exits on other exchanges, they're nowhere near what we see on the US exchange. Um, so the, what should I, as an entrepreneur, what should I, uh, with a startup and an aspiration to uh, get to an exit, <coughs> what, uh, what's the lesson I should take away from this? What I uh, usually advise entrepreneurs when we look at this information is you should focus on trade sale as your first choice exit strategy. If you, if you wanna do an IPO as an exit, okay, but then you should target uh, NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange IPO. Meaning if you have a plan that can get you to a NASDAQ exit, then do it. But if you don't, then focus on trade sale. Um, meaning what? Meaning forget about regional exchange listings. Regional exchange listings uh, have a lot of problems, which I'll talk about in a minute, but uh, basically trade sale or NASDAQ IPO are the two reasonable exit strategies for startups. At the bottom of this chart, you can see the time to exit. So acquisition is about five year average and uh, after seed funding and uh, IPO almost seven years. Now, uh, when looking at realism of IPO versus trade sale exit. So here I did a very quick look at Southeast Asia's top 10 IPOs in 2020. And you can see that only one of them was even remotely a tech company. So this is a, another illustration of why the, um, the exit strategy for startups in Southeast Asia, if you expect to get to a decent exit, most likely it's gonna be a trade sale. Uh, for listings on these regional exchanges, there are uh, almost uh, no tech companies. On the other hand, at the same time, looking at uh, acquisitions of venture funded companies in 2020, uh, I found 117, so a lot. So again, just like in the US, there are very few scalable startups that make it to IPO, and there are quite a few scalable startups that make it to very profitable trade sales. And this is another way of looking at the results of a regional IPO versus a major exchange IPO. Here we can see two of the very successful uh, Southeast Asia-based startups in the last 10 years. You can look at what were the results for these two companies after they did their IPOs. So Razor, uh, which is, uh, both of these companies are originally Singapore-based. Um, Razor, which does, uh, which originally focused on hardware, uh, did a listing in Hong Kong. And you can see their result from uh, listing to 2021. They went from $4 a share down to $3.15 a share. So over the last uh, uh, three years, um, their shareholder value actually declined by about uh, 25% versus uh, uh, C, who does uh, um, e-sports and e-gaming. They went, uh, they saw their, uh, uh, they listed on, uh, New York Stock Exchange. And you can see here, uh, their share value went from in May uh, 2019, $25 to over $275 now. So they saw a 10 time increase in shareholder value over the last two years trading on a major exchange. So I think this is a good example of why if you're going to go for an IPO exit, try to get that IPO on NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange 
forget about regional exchanges, even, even a regional exchange like a Hong Kong exchange, which is pretty good compared to other regional exchanges. This is summarizing the uh, pros and cons of trade sell versus IPO. So if you think about uh, likelihood of success, trade sell wins. If you think about how much will founders and investors get, uh, trade, uh, trade sell, I think, uh, on, I uh, postulate on an expected value basis is still the best. Although on an absolute basis, if you can get to an IPO on a major exchange, you're gonna see more money, but uh, uh, still probability of that is vanishingly low. And then uh, when, will you, when will investors and founders get paid? This is something that a lot of entrepreneurs don't think about until they get to exit. Um, in a trade sale, investors get paid right away and entrepreneurs typically get paid with uh, some significant portion right away and everything within uh, two or three years, maybe maximum four years. Um, for IPO on a regional exchange, uh, you may get uh, investors and shareholders may uh, get paid never or later because why? Uh, they're very low. Uh, a lot of regional exchanges are characterized by very low liquidity, meaning although you listed and you have shares, you can't sell those shares. So, or maybe very difficult for you to find a buyer for those shares. So, although you're now shareholders in publicly traded companies because of the low liquidity in those markets, you may see, you know, the money, uh, little money now, and later we don't know how much money you're going to see. Um, what happens to founders? After, so, it's basically, trade sell wins hands down on that one. Um, what happens to founders after exit? Uh, in a trade sale, typically founders earn out and then decide whether to stay or leave. In the two IPO uh, exits, founders often stay and you can, can stay and often do stay. So I would give that one to IPO, but you can see on the four major factors in choosing your exit strategy, uh, trade sale wins three out of four. All right, so what does the fundraising and investment process look like before we get to exit? This is a typical uh, fundraising process for a startup company. It begins on uh, the my left side of this diagram with founders capital. So founders, uh, before founders get money from investors, they fund the startup with the OM, which is own money, and with FF and F, which is friends, uh, family, and pools money. So OM is a very important first step for every startup. Investors very uh, much want to see that startups have put their um, to put their uh, own money or founders put their own money into the startup. Now, why is that? There are uh, two types of money in the world, OM, which is own money, and OPM, which is other people's money. And when we go out to raise investment, we're looking for other people's money, which is fine. And that's how uh, startups get funded. But uh, in addition to or prior to other people's money, the investors want to see that the founder has put their own money in the business because this creates what investors call skin in the game. Skin in the game means the founders have uh, some of their own money invested in the startup so that if the startup uh, succeeds, they make more. And if the startup fails, they lose some of their own money. So investors want to see that uh, founders are taking similar risks to the risk that they're taking, not just with their time and effort, but also with some of their own money. Now, this uh, leads to the next question. If investors want founders to put some of their own money in the business, uh, enough money to give them skin in the game, what does it mean? The way I like to interpret that, or the way I define that is, 
investors want to see that startup founders put enough money in the business so that if the business fails and the founders lose their money, this will be uh, somewhat painful for the founders. So um, how, much, uh, how much money is it painful for founders to lose? This is going to depend on the founder. Different founders will have different financial situations. So for some founders, losing $5,000 or $10,000 might be very painful. Uh, for other founders, that might they might not even notice that, but uh, so they're going to have to lose $100,000 for it to be painful. So this is what uh, investors are going to look at. How much of their own money has the founder put into the business? And is it a meaningful amount for them so that if they lose it, it's going to be at least somewhat painful? Now, important to note here, some investors unrealistically and unreasonably expect founders not to put just the, what I would call skin in the game, but they want them to put you know, lungs and kidneys into the game, meaning some dumb money investors insist that founders put too much money into the startup or uh, give the founder something like personal guarantee, uh, give the investor something like personal guarantee on their investment. Uh, this is not legitimate. This is not reasonable, uh, own money, uh, skin in the game requirement by investors. So founders should have a reasonable uh, own money stake in the company in order to demonstrate to investors their belief in the business and also to it gives investors some increased confidence that founders are not just going to go out and spend money like crazy. You know, you notice uh, you, one phenomenon we see pretty frequently, the founders are very frugal with their spending before they get investment because it's all their own money. And then as soon as they get investment, they start spending the money like water, you know. So this is not the, uh, the situation that the investor wants to see. The investor wants to see that the, that the founder uh, spends money responsibly, both before and after investment. And we get more confidence that founders are gonna do that when they have some amount of their own money at risk. Friends, uh, FF and F, friends, family, and fools, so most founders will early in the growth of the company raise money from friends uh, and family members. And this is a good sign for investors who like to see that founders were willing and able to raise money from friends and family. Why is this a good thing? Because one, it demonstrates that the founders are able to get money from the people that know them the best and that uh, and the longest because those typically are your friends and family. And this uh, gives the investor more confidence in the founder because people who know them well trust them with investment. Uh, from the other side, when founders take money from friends and family, uh, this suggests the founder is very confident about the business because imagine when you do a startup, uh, and you believe that this is the best possible investment in the world, you're definitely gonna to wanna to try to get your friends and family into that investment. And if you don't wanna do that, then it sort of makes other investors wonder why, uh, since this is such a great opportunity, why are you not sharing it with your friends and family? Why not give them the same you know, great opportunity you're giving us? So uh, it's a win-win, uh, looks good from two sides, for founders to have some money from friends and family. After the own money, friends and family money, most startups will raise money from seed or angel investors. Seed or angel investors, uh, I differentiate here with the uh, seed investors being uh, companies or organizations or venture funds that are specifically focused on the seed stage of investment and angels being individuals who are investing their own money. So uh, for seed funding, startups often go to incubators, accelerators, 
uh, companies and government agencies like uh, our partner SciHub. So uh, Expire runs accelerator programs with SciHub in Vietnam. So uh, you can see that the uh, examples of who are the types of players that provide this seed and angel state funding for startups. Um, after startups raise their seed and or angel round from one of these aforementioned uh, seed or angel funding types, then they that's when startups usually go to the uh, venture capital funding rounds, the traditional VCs um, and, uh, and uh, venture capital investors. The traditional venture funding rounds usually are labeled with letters. So first round is series A, second round series B, third round series C, and so on. Uh, each round uh, can be different size based on the sector uh, and the market. But what we expect is that each round will be bigger than the previous round and that valuation will go up significantly in each round. So however much the company is raising in C, they should raise much more in A and then much more in B and much more in C. We talked before about how do we, uh, how would we calculate those, but that's the basic organization. So both amount of funding and valuation go up as the letters go up. And then after VC rounds, uh, some startups will do intermediate funding rounds. Uh, we call it mezzanine rounds. Some will do pre-IPO rounds and then they exit either in the IPO or trade side. What does the, so how does VC investment uh, process work? The VC uh, sources deals means finds the startup. Uh, they then, VC then does selection and due diligence. So they pick the startups out of the ones that they have had initial uh, contact with and they decide which ones to proceed to due diligence, which is the next stage of investment discussions with. Um, at the same time that they're doing selection and due diligence, preliminary due diligence, the VC will be doing deal structuring and negotiation, uh, assuming the offers are acceptable to both sides. There'll be a term sheet. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, further due diligence investment, then the VC will help the company accelerate scale and VC will then do the same thing with all the companies in their portfolio, which we call portfolio management. So what do uh, uh, the structure, uh, capital and legal structure of venture funded startups look like? The equity funding will be typically divided with uh, common or ordinary shares for uh, entrepreneurs and with preference shares for investors. The other forms of funding for startups are convertible debt, um, safe notes, uh, or other convertible instruments. And occasionally there are some types of options and warrants. And legal structure for the vast majority of venture funding companies will be a corporation or equivalent. So in the US, uh, the preferred structure is corporation. In Singapore, we call private limited company, which is uh, the Singapore version of the corporation. Who gets equity in the company? The management team. Uh, and there's typically some equity set aside for future hires, uh, which we'll talk about later, um, initial investors, and then later institutional investors, including VCs. Now, one uh, other very important fundraising issue is cap tables. So uh, cap tables, uh, also cap table will be included in every uh, term sheet and investment agreement. So it is part of our deal terms. The cap table shows distribution of ownership in the company before and after the investment. Uh, it also will include uh, potential ownership, uh, meaning if there are option holders or 
convertible uh, op, uh, convertible debt holders in the company that are not reflected in the current shareholding. The cap table will also show how much they would own if their uh, instruments did convert. So what makes the, why is cap table important? Because it shows us the distribution of equity and equity is uh, very important in the financing strategy of startup companies because why? Equity is the primary motivator for management and employees. And it's also the asset that the company is gonna sell to investors to fund growth. So who currently owns how much equity? It's really important for investors to determine is man our management and employees uh, key employees properly motivated by the equity that they have and also uh, important to entrepreneurs because this is what this is the tool that entrepreneurs are going to use to grow the company so what is a what are characteristics of a clean cap table and uh, be, meaning before the first uh, VC round uh, potentially after an angel round but before VC round so for uh, what I call a clean cap table, meaning what a cap table should look like before the company goes out to raise their first venture round, either ideally 100% or minimum 90% of the company is owned by founders, team management, team members. 10% um, or less owned by previous angel investors and 10 to 20% is in an ESOP set aside for key hires either already or in the plan. I'll talk about ESOP more uh, detail in the second half when we go over deal to, uh, specific deal terms. So this is what a clean uh, and well-structured cap table looks like. So you can see there's uh, the two columns, pre-financing and post-financing. So pre-financing is what the cap table looks like before investment and here we can see that the management team, which is the CEO and the CPO have together 80% of the company. Uh, now there was an angel round. The angel got uh, four and uh, two, five percent of the company, which is good. That's within our reasonable range for angels. Uh, and if we add the ESOP together with management team, they have 95%. Uh, so this is a nice clean cap table. Uh, after this funding round, the uh, equity will uh, be redistributed, and this is what the company is going to look. Uh, company shareholding structure is going to look like uh, after this round. So, so you uh, you should be strive you should strive to have a cap table that looks like this, or as close to this as possible when you go out for your first uh, post angel or post-seed funding round. Now, what are the most common um, mistakes that startups make in their cap tables or uh, most, these are seven of the most common uh, factors that I define as messy cap tables. So messy cap table is gonna create terrible problems in your deal terms. And cleaning up the cap table will then become a very important part. If your cap table is messy, cleaning up your cap table is gonna become a very difficult part of your deal term discussion and negotiation. And in fact, in the under some circumstance, the uh, messy cap table can be a walk away point for investors who might otherwise have been interested to invest in your company. So what are some of the uh, situations that I have seen causing these messy cap tables? The first one is part-time founders. So part-time founder means uh, the founder size equity stake is held by somebody who is not a full-time founder in the company. Full-time founder in the company means for a startup that this founder does not have full-time employment elsewhere. They're 
full-time employed by the startup company, or in the worst case, they don't have full-time employment elsewhere. And part-time founders shouldn't have uh, founder size equity stakes in company in startups. So founder, I define the founder size equity stake as an equity stake that's in the equity double digits or any actually anything more than uh, let's say one to 3% equity would qualify as a founder stake. So uh, nobody who's part-time in the company should have more than one or 2% equity. Uh, variation on this is inactive founder. So a founder who used to be full-time is not full-time anymore. And that founder, that inactive founder still has a founder size equity stake in the company. This is also not acceptable. Uh, third mess that we see in the cap table is what I call superstar strategic advisor. So superstar strategic advisor, they're by definition, they're not a founder because they're just an advisor and they have, but they have a founder size stake in the company. And this is also uh, gonna create problems in our cap table because the principle here is the operative principle for equity distribution in the cap table is only full-time founders and financial investors should have significant equity stake. Since a superstar strategic advisor is neither of those, they shouldn't have the full uh, founder size equity stake, but uh, especially in uh, Southeast Asia startups, we do see this. Um, and oftentimes the founders seem to have some like variation of the Stockholm syndrome, which is where a kidnapped victim uh, begins to you know, have strong positive feelings about the kidnapper. So I have seen companies where founders have this attachment to these advisors and think they should have these huge equity stakes, but it's, it's not correct. And it's gonna cause problems with venture investors who don't wanna see messy cap tables. Venture builders are a type of uh, organization or company that looks like incubator and accelerator, but it's actually different because incubators and accelerators, what they do is they, um, they help found startup founding teams to grow faster. Uh, Venture Builder is an organization that takes a leading role in developing a startup. So usually the venture builder, they have the idea for the startup and they hire a management team to help develop the idea. So the management team becomes like an employee of the venture builder. So the venture builder takes a, typically the venture builder takes a product market fit first approach to startup. So they think that their strategy or philosophy is they come up with ideas for what they think will make successful startups, and then they try to find teams to grow these startups. Um, incubators and accelerators try to find teams that have great startup ideas and help them succeed. So I don't believe much in the concept of venture building, but uh, and I uh, definitely don't believe that venture builders should have founder size equity stakes in company. Uh, next problem that we see in cap table is. Uh, technology vendors or other service providers who have large equity stakes in companies or any equity stake in company. The early days of the company, the startup often doesn't have a lot of cash or maybe almost zero cash, but they need work done. So in some cases they strike deals with vendors to pay them with equity. And this is another one of those decisions that seems very positive when you make it. And it seems like very uh, in the balance, great for the company because you get people to do work. Basically you get people or companies to do work without paying, uh, which is a nice feeling. But if you're paying with equity, you're probably way overpaying because although your equity is not maybe worth a lot today, if your company is successful, your equity is gonna be worth a lot more in the future. So uh, technology vendors tend to 
not be very useful after the initial development project, uh, and we don't want to see them as long-term shareholders in the cap table. Another form of messy cap table, a lot of small investors. So this, let's say we see startups that have raised, um, let's say, 10, you know, let's say they raise $100,000 from, you know, 20 investors that put $5,000 each into the company. And although they got, you know, nice $20,000, but now the cap table is very crowded with small investors. This is definitely going to become a problem later uh, because every shareholder is a potential problem. And uh, shareholders can... For example, at the most basic level, shareholders can become difficult to contact uh, because they move around. They don't, uh, not really uh, thinking much about the company, let's say five or 10 years from now. And shareholders have to, for legal reasons, have to sign many important documents for the company. So just imagine, you know, five years from now, you had 20 small shareholders that you haven't been regularly keeping in touch with. You need to find all of them to sign documents for you. So uh, too many small investors. And then last cap table problem, I mentioned that everybody who has some claim on equity in the company should be in the cap table. Uh, oftentimes we see entrepreneurs when they did their friends and family funding, they didn't clearly document the, the deal that they did with friends and family so this friends and family, either debt or equity are not clearly reflected in the cap table. So I call this undocumented or poorly documented um, deals with friends and family investors. And when I bring this up with a lot of founders, they say, oh, don't worry about it. It's my good friend. Oh, it's my family member. Oh, we don't need documentation. We agree everything with a handshake, it's fine. Um, and my response to that is, it's not, uh, that's all the more reason that you want to have clear um, documentation uh, reflected in your cap table about what you agreed to. Because, I mean, do we, does every, in everybody's experience, you know, is it true that friends and family never argue about money? It's totally not true. Um, money can cause big problems between friends and family members. And those type of problems are very common in uh, startups that are raising money because if things go very badly or if things go very well. So if things go very badly, there a lot of people can, uh, shareholders can lose money. And then when there wasn't a clear agreement with one or more shareholders or who people who thought they were supposed to be shareholders, this can become very ugly and difficult. Um, or there's a company that does really well and suddenly there's a lot of money at stake and some people don't have clear documentation about which, how much of that money should be owed to them. And again, if that's a friend and fam or family member, this can be a very difficult situation for the uh, founder because now you have friends and family who uh, you have personal and maybe very deep relationships with uh, getting involved with uh, the economic uh, issues in your company. And this can mean that when, when this goes bad, not only do you have a you know, problem with the shareholder, but you can have a problem with a family member. So for friends and family uh, deals, it's, I always say it's even more important to have good, clear agreements so that if something goes wrong, not only uh, do you uh, not uh, damage or destroy the business relationship you had with this person, but you don't damage or destroy the friendship or the family relationship you had with this person. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my discussion about uh, cap tables. I'm going to, now we're gonna take a short break. So it's a, it's 11.10 my time, 10.10 10 your time. So we'll take a, a 15 minute break and we will resume at 10.25 uh, your time, 11.25 my time. And then we'll start talking. I'm gonna go into a specific, more de detailed discussion of uh, specific deal terms. So 
uh, everybody uh, enjoy your break and I will see you back here in 15 minutes.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Hope that you all had a good break. And I'm going to continue now, unless it, unless there are any questions. Anybody have any questions on what we talked about in the first half? I can answer those questions now. I think people haven't uh, got back yet. Oh, not back yet. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So yeah, let's give them. We'll give them a couple of minutes to come back. Yeah. Sure. How are we doing now? Okay, how about uh, if let's just begin now and if there's a few people still coming back, so well, they can catch up when they join. So now that we learned about some of the most important big picture items relating to deal terms, let's get down to a little more detail about the key deal terms. So these are five key agreements that 
are involved in venture capital and startup deals. And starting with the term sheet. So the first agreement that you're likely to encounter if you're a startup uh, doing a deal with an investor is uh, an agreement called a term sheet. And term sheet is the is an indication that a dis the discussion with an investor is serious and that it's uh, proceeding to the next stage. One thing to watch out for is long uh, drawn out discussions with investors that don't lead to term sheets. Uh, it meaning until an investor sends a term sheet, uh, then everything is just talk. Uh, once you get a term sheet from an investor, now the discussion about investment starts to get serious. So uh, I, I wouldn't say that there's a, a specific length of time to expect to get a term sheet, but you should have a, a pretty good sense that is this discussion with investors proceeding as expected uh, if you're getting term sheet within a reasonable amount of time. If the investor, let's say it, discussions are dragging on for months, investors are asking for a lot of information, you know, asking for more detail over and over, but no term sheet, then this is probably a waste of time and you should politely, you know, move, uh, politely uh, ask to when are you going to get the term sheet? And if there's no answer forthcoming, then move on to discussion with the next investor. Uh, so you don't want to, um, you know, insult this investor or you know, be rude or damage relationship because maybe later you're going to get money from them under other circumstance, but uh, yeah, politely uh, move on. So what's in a term sheet? Term sheet uh, will include all the key terms of the proposed investment uh, and shareholder agreements. So if uh, especially equity investment, investors will often, will always begin or should almost always begin with the term sheet. Now, some, some startups, you know, sometimes startups send term sheets to investors. It's not correct. Um, in a, this may be required, for example, with some angel investors who don't have a standard term sheet or don't have experience developing term sheets, but the normal flow should be from investor to startup. The investor sends you the term sheet and this includes, you know, all, this includes all of the key terms that the investor is proposing for their agreement, uh, for their agreements with you. Now, one, one uh, optimization problem with term sheet, do we want to do a less detailed term sheet quickly, or do we want to do a more detailed term sheet, but it takes longer? Because the shorter and less detail there is in our term sheet, usually the faster it is to agree because there's fewer terms to agree. Uh, so just to step back, the way the term sheet process goes, investor will send you the term sheet and then you re uh, company reviews the term sheet and consults a lawyer that understands startup term sheets, gets uh, the feedback from the lawyer and gets their own, derives their own feedback. And then you will send your marked up version of the term sheet back to investors who will, and then you'll have a discussion about it. And then they'll uh, probably send you another remark version. You'll review that. Uh, there may be one or several more rounds of markup and discussion. Uh, this is a negotiation. So you'll be negotiating the terms in the term sheet when the terms in the term sheet have been agreed to the satisfaction of both the startup and the investor, then both sign the term sheet. So as you can imagine, 
the more detail there is in the term sheet, the longer this process takes because there's more things to negotiate about and there's more terms to uh, agree on and to mark up. So which should we do? Very um, simple and fast term sheet and get to an agreement quickly and then sign it. Uh, or should we do a longer, more detailed term sheet uh, that's going to take a longer period of time to negotiate, mark up, and agree. Uh, I like to, I, my, my preference is for getting a more detailed term sheet. And even though that's going to take longer, it's going to be worth it in the long run. Because why? The, some startups, you know, I see some startups, they think when we, you know, when we sign the term sheet, everything is done. It's not true at all. It's not even close to true. When we sign the term sheet, everything has begun. The investment has begun. The investment is nowhere near done when we sign, when we agree and sign the term sheet. Um, at least one third and maybe more of ter signed term sheets never lead to an investment. So uh, I would say somewhere between, you know, 25 and 50% of signed term sheets won't ever become real deals. So uh, the key is to get a term sheet that's likely to lead to a real deal. So why do term sheets not lead to real deals? The, there are a couple of reasons. First reason is due diligence. So after term sheets are, before term sheets are signed, investors may do what we call preliminary due diligence. Uh, preliminary due diligence means the investor is asking for more detailed information from the company than was supplied in the original pitch deck and maybe financial model or uh, maybe business plan. So the, the purpose of due diligence is to verify any, verify any claims that the startup has made in their interaction with the investor and also look for any um, information that might be important for the investment decision. Oh, um, okay. So there were two questions right now. Um, so, which are relevant to what I'm talking about. So I'll answer both those questions. So <coughs> the first question is, what if the investor asked the startup to send the agreement? Uh, so send the term sheet. So this is okay, like if the investor asks startup to send a term sheet, uh, their term sheet, then what we can do on the startup side, then we send our ideal term sheet to the investor. So we, we structure the term sheet in such a way that it has everything that we want and we send it to the investor. Um, but it's... Uh, it's good to note, so we should note that when the investor is uh, asking us to send the term sheet, then we have learned that that investor is not very sophisticated or is likely what we would call dumb money investor. So an investor that's requesting a term sheet from a startup, they're, they're not gonna be a smart money investor. So we, that doesn't mean we shouldn't take investment from them but we should be aware of that information and we should make sure that we are comfortable with the investor required uh, requ with the investors um, knowledge of venture capital deals and investing in startups. Because the reason I say that because smart money or professional investors or VCs, they don't ask startups to send agreement. They send their own term sheet. So second question, um, should we send NDA? Yeah, this is a really good uh, point. We should, before we, um, when should we do an NDA? In, in every investment process, we need to do an NDA. Um, now, the key here is when should we do an NDA? For those that are not familiar with that, it's non-disclosure and confidentiality agreement. So we should never send an NDA before we do the first pitch. 
because this is um, this is wrong. And um, most VCs, including us, we won't sign an NDA before our first pitch because we can never know what the startup is going to pitch, and therefore we can't agree not to disclose anything. Um, that came up in the pitch because we might, for example, have already invested in a company that's doing the exact same thing as a startup. So we may already know a lot of the information that the startup is going to pitch, <coughs> is going to pitch. But then, but then when we uh, disclose that later, the startup might claim that we learned it in our pitch with them when in fact we already knew all this information because we've invested in a company that's doing the same thing. So uh, one example. So what the startup should do is make sure <clears throat> that in the first pitch, they don't include, <clears throat> they don't include anything that requires an NDA. So restrict your first pitch to disclosable information. But after a successful first pitch, then investors may ask for more detailed information like detailed financial data, uh, financial statements, information about customers. Uh, at that point, it's fair and reasonable to um, require an NDA. So in this case, startup or investor can send the NDA. It doesn't matter. Um, if you have a standard NDA, you can send it to the investor and uh, at this point, meaning post first presentation, uh, once investors have requested more detailed information, then investors should be willing to sign NDAs. Okay, so good question. Okay, so we have a, um, the reason I prefer more detailed term sheet and why I think it's worth spending time uh, to negotiate the term sheet in detail is the term sheet doesn't end the investment process. The term sheet just begins the official investment process. Uh, so why is it that so many, uh, why is it that term sheets fail to lead to investment? First reason is failed due diligence. Meaning after we sign the term sheet and the inve uh, investor does due diligence on the company, they uncover things during due diligence that mean they don't want to invest anymore. Uh, what type of things might they uncover? Uh, inaccuracies or misrepresentations in something that the startup uh, already presented or uh, red flags that are unearthed during due diligence process. Uh, so that means this term sheet may never become, will never become an investment uh, agreement and shareholder agreement. Uh, and the, or the other reason is we're not able to arrive at a final negotiation, uh, final negotiated agreements. So the final agreements, the ones that really mean that are really accompanying the investment are investment agreement and shareholder agreement, assuming this is an equity investment. So if it's an equity investment, there will be an investment agreement and shareholder agreement that need to be signed before the investment goes in. Now, what happens in between term sheet and final agreements? If the term sheet was too simple and did not detailed enough, there will be uh, there will be many terms that were not included in the term sheet that need to be negotiated at the final document stage. And if we're not able to agree on some of these terms in the final document stage, then the deal doesn't happen. Ideally, we want to identify any, what I would call deal breaking differences of agreement on terms in the term sheet stage, not in the deal document stage. And this is, uh, we're much more likely to have deal breaking disagreements on terms when we get to the document stage, if we have not negotiated a detailed term sheet. So, uh, what's an example of that? So, for example, um, one of the terms that'll be in every shareholder agreement is something called reserve matters. And I'll talk about reserve matters in, in more detail in a minute. But <coughs> when we're in the term sheet stage, 
oftentimes the initial investor initial term sheet will say that we're going to include the customary uh, customary reserve matters customary reserve matters but who knows what is customary it might say standard and customary reserve matters but later when we get the shareholder agreement there's a list of 15 reserve matters and the investor just says these are the ones that we think are um, standard and customary but actually maybe you startup has a big problem with one or two of these and you're never going to agree to them but investors will uh, not remove them or change them and now the deal falls apart now if there was a instead of in the term sheet if we saw instead of standard and customary reserve matters we saw a list of the reserve matters then we can discuss those at the term sheet stage and if we realize that we're never going to reach agreement on certain key reserve matters at the term sheet stage then we don't bother to go to the final document stage and we save a lot of time so the principle of a detailed term sheet and spending our time negotiating on term sheet terms is we don't want to waste time. We want to waste as little time as possible on deals that are never going to happen. Now, on the other hand, we don't want to have a term sheets that that is as detailed as the final agreements. Otherwise, then we might as well negotiate final agreements, you know, from the first. So what's the rule uh, of thumb that we should use? all the commercial terms so key commercial terms should be agreed in the term sheet stage there should be no commercial terms that are left uh, for uh, the final document stage in the final document stage we should only be uh, negotiating about drafting meaning the legal drafting of the commercial terms or negotiating on standard legal terms that are not part of the commercial terms in the agreement. So this, uh, I know that this can make the term sheet negotiation process longer uh, and slow it down, but guarantee it's worth it because you will uh, waste much less time negotiating detailed documents that never lead to agreement. Oh. So that okay, there was another question uh, from the from the uh, participants. How much equity should we put for employees, and should we set up before or after investment? So that's a question about ESOP, and I'm gonna I'm gonna just uh, I'm gonna answer that question in a minute. So let's uh, put a, a pin in that one, uh, and then I'll discuss the answer to that in a couple of minutes. Okay, so after term sheet, term sheet are. Uh, the first discussion of the key, the first agreement on key terms, key terms of what? Key terms of the shareholder and investment agreements. So the two final agreements we call the investment documents are the investment agreement and shareholder agreement. The investment agreement um, relates to the investment and it basically, uh, investment agreement is usually pretty simple. <clears throat> it just talks about the terms of the investment. So the investor is going to um, pay this much and get what in return? You know, how many shares are they going to get? What's the price of those shares? How much is the investor going to in invest? When are they going to send the money? Um, where do they need to send it to? And then most of the rest of the investment agreement talks about what happens if something goes wrong. Like what if the investor doesn't send the money on time? What if the company doesn't send the shares, et cetera, et cetera. So investment agreement, it's usually pretty simple and straightforward. But the key agreement in an equity investment is the shareholder agreement. The shareholder agreement is the uh, agreement that sets out what are the rights of the shareholders, the new shareholders and existing shareholders after the investment. And this is the one that we're going to spend most time negotiating. This is the one that is going to be the most complicated and difficult. So uh, mo the vast majority of term sheet terms are going to relate to terms in the shareholder agreement. Now, 
some of these shareholder agreements get very long. You can have 25 pages, 50 pages, even 100 uh, or more pages of shareholder agreement. So should you have the lawyer, uh, should you involve a lawyer in your document negotiation? Definitely you should. Um, and, and should you just get any lawyer? Definitely you shouldn't. There's a lot of, I, I met quite a few lawyers in, in Southeast Asia, specifically in Thailand and Vietnam. They know nothing about startup agreements. So don't get the wrong lawyer. It's actually, it's better to have no lawyer than wrong lawyer. I, you, because no lawyer, at least, you know, you're responsible for your own mistakes, but you don't want to have a lawyer that doesn't really know how to do startup deals because then they give you bad advice. Bad advice in some ways is worse than no advice. Uh, so make sure when you, so do have, unless you're very, very familiar with, uh, share, with startup shareholder agreements, uh, you should get a lawyer to advise you on the agreement and make sure the lawyer understands how startup deals work. If you need recommendation on that, Expira or Sciub can help with recommendation uh, to lawyers that are uh, familiar with venture capital and startup deals. Okay, so um, employment agreements. Um, these are not specifically related to the investment, but uh, every member of the management team is going to need to have an employment agreement with the company prior to the investment. So if you don't already have those agreements in place, then you should get them in place. Actually, if you're a startup, you should have employment agreements for all of your founders. Now, don't wait for investment to do that because um, startup founders are also employees. They're shareholders, but they're also employees. And those two different roles have very different responsibilities. So the uh, employment agreement should be very clear about the responsibility that the founders have as employees <clears throat> separate from their responsibility as shareholders and maybe even directors. So it's, uh, uh, it's good for you also because even before you have investment, there can be disagreements between startup founders relating to their responsibilities or rights as employees. So you wanna make sure <clears throat> that any confusion about that is identified and removed as soon as possible. Okay, and the last key agreement is the ESOP or ESOP, uh, ESOP's agreement. So this is the employee stock ownership plan or employee stock ownership scheme. And this was the one that there was a question about. So uh, in ESOP's plan, or uh, we, the company agrees to set aside uh, some percentage of the equity in the company for issuance to current and future key employees in the future to either to attract or retain key team members. So um, the typically the ESOP or ESOS sets out the rules that will govern the company's issuance of usually options. So usually what happens is the ESOP plan issues options later, which will be convertible into shares of the company once the options are exercised. And there's a question about how much equity should be earmarked for ESOP. Now, important to note is equity doesn't get put into the ESOP, meaning we don't transfer shares to an ESOP. The ESOP uh, authorizes the company to issue options up to a certain percentage of equity in the company. So the ESOP doesn't cause any share transfer or any change of share ownership in a company. The ESOP is another one of these dilutive uh, instruments. So it's an agreement that has the potential to dilute existing shareholder, but it typically doesn't own shares itself and it doesn't result in any change in share ownership when it's implemented. What it does is it authorizes the company to issue options and later these options can be converted into shares. So how much should the, what uh, percentage of equity in the company should be subject to the ESOP? This depends on how, uh, how robust is the current management team? Uh, how many, uh, key level hires will the company need to make and uh, how much equity do the current key team members have? So 
but as a as a range, we would usually expect to see somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of equity subject to the ESOP. Um, maybe a little less in some cases if the team is very robust. Uh, maybe a little more if the team has a lot of holes and we need to um, and we need to add a lot of key team members in the future. So I would say answer somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. Should we set up the ESOP before or after investment? Uh, so if we set up the ESOP before investment, then typically it only dilutes the existing shareholders. If we set up the ESOP after investment, then it can dilute the incoming investor as well as the existing shareholder. So from the company perspective, it's usually better to implement the ESOP after the investment. What we might do is uh, develop the ESOP plan, but uh, but don't implement the ESOP until after the investment or when we negotiate with investors, negotiate that the ESOP should be implemented post-investment so that both investor and startup uh, original shareholders will be subject to the dilution that uh, will be incurred when the ESOP is, uh, issues options. Okay, so... Let's look at the let's look at the key elements of uh, investment deals. These are a list of the key terms in a typical venture capital startup deal. You can see that there are two categories of key terms. On the left side, my left side are the economic terms. And on my right side are the control terms. <clears throat> so the economic terms are terms that affect the division of the economic fruits of this business. So how will the economic fruits of this business be shared among the shareholders, including the existing shareholders and the new shareholders who are coming in? The control terms, which are on my right side, address in, uh, in what way and to what degree will actions of the, the actions that the company might take post investment be uh, controlled by or affected by the new investor. So economic terms and control terms. Both are uh, very important for a good relationship after the investment. So it's really important that entrepreneurs and uh, founding team members understand all of the key terms that are going to be in the agreement and make sure that you get the key terms uh, that you are comfortable with in your investment agreements. So for each of the terms that we're looking at here, the economic terms and the control terms, there are usually three versions of each term. One is the company friendly version, two is the investor friendly version, and three is the neutral version, meaning favors neither investor or company. So when you negotiate with investors, what should you be trying to accomplish? The final agreements, you know, should they be all investor friendly or all company friendly, um, all neutral? You know, probably not. Like what happens with most uh, venture startup negotiation and the final form of most of the agreements for venture financing will be a mix. So, uh, so some uh, terms will be company friendly, some terms will be investor friendly, and some terms will be neutral. And this is, a, I think, a indication that we did a good deal. Like one of the points I like to make with entrepreneurs is how should you feel after you sign the final agreements with your investor? Should you feel really happy 
or should you feel really miserable? Like, I think it, actually you shouldn't feel really happy or really miserable. You should feel um, in between. You should feel like, my, I would say mildly dissatisfied, meaning you don't feel so happy, you don't feel miserable, you feel sort of in the middle. Like, why is that? Because negotiating good agreements, especially for something as complex as a venture capital agreement, involves in a give and take from both sides. If I got, let's say, you know, let's say after you finish the, the negotiation with investors, you feel like, wow, I got everything that I want. I really screwed them to the wall. I mean, does that feel good? In some way, it might short term feel good, but in the long term, it's not correct. And the same way the investor shouldn't feel like that. As an investor closing a deal with a startup, I never want to feel like, wow, I got everything that I want and I screwed them to the wall. Like, because why? If you think about what, what's, our, uh, what's our relationship after the investment? After the investment, we're partners. I'm a shareholder in your company and you're a shareholder in your company and we're partners in this company. And for how long? Forever. We're partners in this company until this company either dies or succeeds. And in you know real life, that can be five to 10 years. So we just entered into a five to 10 year partnership. And how do you wanna feel about your partner when you start a partnership? Do you wanna feel like, wow, this partner really screwed me? I mean, this is not a good way to start a partnership. And if one side is too happy, the other side is definitely gonna feel like that. I think what you wanna feel like is, you know, we, we had a lively and spirited negotiation on this deal. I got some things that were really important to me, but I gave on some things that were really important to the other side. And in the end, I didn't get everything I want. He didn't get everything that he wanted. We both compromised and we arrived at a good deal, a deal that's okay for both sides. So uh, that's usually, I think the best outcome for our, uh, startup and VC negotiation. Okay, now we already talked about the first two terms on the left side, price per share, which is basically a function of valuation and amount of investment. How does it work? Um, remember we talked about pre and post money valuation. So the price per share will be the amount of the financing divided by the pre money valuation. So for example, if if I'm investing a million dollars, or let's say I'm investing $500,000 and the, if the pre-money, uh, let's say I'm investing uh, $500,000 and the pre-money valuation was, uh, um, was uh, $2.5 million or $2 million like we usually do. So $500,000 uh, divided by uh, pre-money valuation. Oh, sorry. Divided by the uh, number of shares outstanding uh, bef before investment. So the price per share will be the pre-money valuation uh, divided by the number of shares before the investment. And then how many shares I get will be determined by the amount of money I'm investing um, divided by the share price. So that's how we work out price per share. And that's how we figure out how many shares I get for my investment. So I think we're clear on that because we spent a lot of time already talking about valuation. The second term in the list is liquidation preference. Um, liquidation preference is the most important economic term after valuation. And it's one that a lot of entrepreneurs don't understand or have you know, very strong um, uh, emotional reactions to, which is a, which is a big mistake. And um, this is one where uh, I think this is a economic term that entrepreneurs very often uh, screw up the negotiation on. So 
How, let's talk about liquidation preference first. How does liquidation preference, what is it and how does it work? In a normal liquidation, there's no preferences. So when everybody has the same class of shares and we liquidate the company in, uh, in the best case, when we sell the company, the proceeds from that sale are divided among the shareholders proportionately to their shareholding. So we call that type of uh, distribution a pro rata distribution, meaning you, let's say I invest 500,000 and I get 20% of your company. So you have 80%. And then let's, let's say I invested uh, 1 million for 20%. So later we sell the company for a hundred million. You get 80 million, I get 20 million. That's called a pro rata distribution of the proceeds and there's no preferences there. But if I'm an investor, uh, if I'm a venture capital investor, I may want a, what's called a liquidation preference uh, because I'm gonna have preferred shares and one of the preference terms that I might get is preferential liquidation. How does that work? When we have the liquidation preference, the proceeds from any uh, liquidity events are no longer distributed pro rata. They're distributed according to the liquidation preference in what's called a liquidation preference waterfall. What does that mean? There's uh, two types of liquidation preferences which are called uh, participating and not participating. And liquidation preference in addition to the type will also have an amount attached. So the amount of the liquidation preference is usually expressed as a multiple of the original investment. So for example, one uh, X the original investment means the same as the original investment. Two uh, X means twice the original investment. If uh, uh, this uh, means that we can have four types of liquidation preference um, or uh, not four types, but two types with different parameters. So let's say we have participating, non-participating, and then let's say we only look at one X and two X. So we can have there are now, uh, you know, uh, participating one X, participating two X, non-participating one X, non-participating 2x. So let's focus on only 1x because 1x is the most common amount of liquidation. In the case where we have a, uh, we have a 1x non-participating liquidation preference. So the way that that works is now when there's an exit, the investor gets back either one time their investment or their pro rata share. So the investor has to choose. They get back one or the other. Now that's different from before, right? Because without liquidation preference, the investor gets uh, their pro rata share, no choice. In the case of a 1X non-participating liquidation preference, now they have a choice. They can choose either get back their original investment or get back their pro rata share. Now, if we use the same numbers as my previous example, the investor invested 1 million and they got 20%. So if I, if that investor has a one X participating liquidation, non-participating liquidation preference, now when the company is sold for hundred million, they get to choose between getting back their original 1 million or getting 20%, which would be 20 million. Obviously in this case, they're going to take the 20 million. Now, why would this, how does this benefit the investor? When would they ever take the 1 million? They would take the 1 million when 20% of the exit price is less than 1 million. So example, let's say instead of selling this company for hundred million, you sell for 4 million. In that case, I would get 20% of 4 million, which means I would get 800,000. So in this case, I would choose my liquidation preference. I take 1 million instead of uh, 800,000. The next, the other variation of liquidation preference works a little differently. It's called participating liquidation preference. In the participating liquidation preference, the investor doesn't choose. They get both. They get first their original investment back, and then next they get their pro rata share. 
So in this example, if they invested 1 million for 20% and we sold the company for 100 million, first they would get back 1 million. And then they would get 20% of 99 million, which is 1 million minus the liquidation preference. And instead of you getting 80% of 100 million, you would get also 80% of 99 million. So that's called the 1x participating liquidation preference. Now, again, when we look at an exit deal of 100 million, it doesn't seem to make much difference. But if we go to, uh, if we go look at um, example two again, where the company sold for 4 million. So now if I have 1x participating and a company was sold for 4 million, first the investor gets back their 1 million and then the investor and the entrepreneur split 3 million. So because exit was four, uh, was 4 million minus 1 million liquidation preference left to split is only three. And here we can see that the economics of the investor change a lot. Uh, the benefit to them of the participating liquidation preference is very uh, much higher when the company sells at lower valuations. And especially if the company sells at a valuation below the investment uh, value, uh, initial investment valuation. So if you think about liquidation preference in terms of company friendly, um, investor friendly and neutral, I would say that um, participating liquidation preference is investor friendly, uh, no liquidation preference is company friendly and non-participating liquidation preference is uh, neutral. So that's a good example of how these uh, deal terms can have three variations. And uh, in a negotiation, we can decide which of these we want to focus on as a company to get our version and which we're willing to give the investor version and where we want to see a neutral version instead. So uh, one thing that entrepreneurs miss about liquidation preference is liquidation preference, it's a form of valuation insurance. It's not real insurance because it, it doesn't pay off in every case, but it does reduce the investor's downside from overvaluation. Therefore, what? Uh, therefore, if the startup is willing to agree to some form of liquidation preference, they should be able to get a better valuation, meaning higher valuation. So, I would, that's why I said, uh, I think entrepreneurs often misunderstand liquidation preference, uh, sometimes reject immediately, uh, but without using liquidation preference as a negotiating tool to get a better valuation. So where I, what I would advise is to do, first of all, never do liquidation preference with a multiple greater than one X and don't do participating liquidation preference. So that's why I think non-participating 1x liquidation preference is the best term for uh, both startup and investor. <clears throat> why? Because it protects the investor's downside to some degree, and it gives the startup maximum possible valuation uh, versus no liquidation preference. Okay, next term, uh, next economic term is vesting. And this is a uh, a uh, super important investment term uh, that a lot of startups miss, miss, uh, miss out or screw up. This is a uh, economic term that can impact, that will impact founders much more than investors. But for some reason, I find a lot of founders don't like this vesting term where they should love it because it's all uh, designed to protect them and that's why investors often feel so strongly about it. So how does it work? Um, vesting requires that founders stay with the stay full time employed by the company for a pre agreed period of time before they own all their equity. A typical vesting schedule, for example, will be four years. And um, how does that work? Let's say we have the uh, uh, four founders that each have 25% of the company. And 
they own the equity outright. So that means after the investment, let's say an investor comes in and gets 20%. So each founder would give up 5% and the uh, after the investment, the investor would have 20% and the remaining founders would have 20% each. But what happens if one of those founders leaves right after the investment or uh, within one year of the investment, for example? This means that now 20% of the equity in the company just walked out the door with that founder. So that founder still, uh, since they own their equity outright, they take it with them when they leave. And this leaves a 20% equity hole in the company's uh, cap table, meaning the company has 20% what we call dead equity. Worse than that, now we need a new, uh, assume that the founder that left was the CTO. Now we need a new CTO. So we're going to have to hire a new CTO and we're most likely going to have to give that new CTO equity. So we're going to not only lose 20% of the equity in the company to a non-active founder, but now we're going to give up more equity to replace them. So this situation could have been avoided if the founders had an equity vesting schedule. Equity vesting schedule means, uh, in my previous example, four years. So the founder who has 20% will have to work full-time for the company for four years to earn that 20% equity. If they leave before four years, their equity is, uh, is clawed back by the company. And typical equity vesting schedule will say, if the founder leaves within 12 months, meaning uh, they don't complete one year, they lose everything, give up all equity. If they leave after one year, but before two years, then they keep 25%. So in the case where the founder had, each founder had 20%, after one year, each founder would have earned 5%. After two years, 10%, and they would earn the full 20% after four years. So this is uh, super important for you as a founder. I'm, I mean, I have worked with many startups that didn't have founder vesting in place. And when one of the founders left or was gotten rid of because they're not performing, the company, uh, the rest of the management team or the rest of the founding team has, uh, is very demotivated because they uh, are not able to get that equity back and increase their stake, or they have to give up more of their equity to bring in a replacement. So definitely every startup should have founder vesting. I would say, I would say you should have that now. Uh, don't wait for investment agreement. If you don't have founder vesting agreement, you should put it in place as soon as possible. Um, this is uh, um, one of those situations where uh, Founders sometimes tell me, oh, we don't need agreements like this because we're all friends. Yeah, I have seen many uh, situations where friendship, I've even seen like, uh, you know, married couples that were co-founders uh, who had terrible, terrible arguments and problems in their relationship because uh, they didn't clearly document the vesting schedule that was expected for each founder. So don't delay on this. and. Uh, you know, strangely, I encounter startup CEOs who don't want founder vesting. And I always uh, don't understand that because the CEO is the least likely founder to leave the team. When is the CEO ever going to leave before everybody else of their own volition is very rare. So they're the one that stands to suffer the most from other founders leaving. So they should actually be the one that's most um, interested in getting this vesting in place. Okay, next uh, economic term is option pool or ESOP or ESOS, which we already discussed. Um, so this is a very important term because we, we want to make sure that we have enough equity to distribute to new and existing key team members in the future to keep them motivated. And this is another one where sometimes uh, uh, startup founders seem not to want this, but uh, I always uh, explain to the founder, it's actually in your benefit to have uh, 
options pool because who's awarding the options? Usually the options are being proposed by the key by the CEO uh, or the top management team. So what the option plan does, it gives them the ability to um, recommend and award these options without requiring a full shareholder vote. Because options are dilutive, uh, usually to issue options, the management would have to get approval or even the board would have to get approval from shareholders. Um, the option plan basically uh, has shareholders pre-approve issuance of options up to the amount of the plan. So this is very uh, much in the interest of the existing management team and shareholders and no reason that they should not want uh, to have a maximum size option pool. I think they, they sometimes have a bad reaction because they think all the shares are taken out immediately, but they're not. If the, if the ESOP doesn't issue options up to the maximum, then, then the existing shareholders are not diluted by the amount that's not issued. So this is a easy yes for the startup. Anti-dilution. Now, this, this term is often called anti-dilution protection. Um, so I, it's a little uh, ungrammatical because anti-dilution protection suggests that you're being protected against anti-dilution, which is wrong. Uh, so, but just so you know, people often call anti-dilution protection. And you might wonder, why do we need dilution protection if dilution is good, as I mentioned in the previous slide? The answer is anti-dilution does not protect investors from dilution. Anti-dilution protects investors from excessive dilution. Excessive dilution means dilution that uh, where the shares are sold in the future at a price lower than what the investor paid. That's excessive dilution. So if you think about the previous, uh, my previous uh, um, analogy why dilution is not bad. My slice of the pie is getting smaller, but the pie overall is getting bigger. Excessive dilution occurs when the pie gets smaller. So my slice either get, uh, stays the same or gets smaller, uh, but the pie itself also gets smaller. So that's called excessive dilution. And anti-dilution will protect investors against that um, to one degree or another. The, the strongest forms of anti-dilution will, um, will shift all excessive dilution from investors to founders, uh, or from more, more uh, precisely from PREF, sharehold from PREF shareholders to ordinary or common shareholders. More common forms of anti-dilution will shift some of the dilution from preference shareholders to ordinary shareholders, meaning uh, Preference shareholders will be diluted less than expected uh, with, in the absence of anti-dilution and ordinary shareholders will be diluted more. So anti-dilution is another term where uh, founders should be able to use this term to improve valuation. Why? Again, anti-dilution is a, uh, a form of dilute, of, uh, valuation insurance because uh, anti-dilution only kicks in when future valuations are lower than current valuation. If future valuation is lower than current valuation, that means current valuation is too high. So in that sense, the anti-dilution clause protects investors against the, the possibility that the current value is too high. In that case, again, investors should be willing to uh, give higher valuations to companies who are willing to give them anti-dilution. So I'm, I, am, uh, I advise startups to be willing to take anti-dilution uh, and not the most severe form, but a reasonable form of anti-dilution, uh, which uh, we have the terms for if you're interested to find out more about that, but we usually call it broad, broad-based weighted average anti-dilution. Um, why I think this can be a good deal. So this would be another example where the company agreed to a balanced or maybe in some way even company friendly term 
<clears throat> because they're giving the investor anti-dilution, what they get in exchange is higher valuation. And the good thing about anti-dilution, it never comes into play unless the company has a down round. Meaning unless a future round is raised at a lower price than the current round, anti-dilution doesn't hurt you at all. So if you give anti-dilution and then you avoid a down round, you win. It's a win-win for you because assuming that you were able to get a better valuation by giving on anti-dilution. The pay to play term means that in order for investors to um, acquire the rights of the next round shareholder, they need to, investors need to um, participate in the next round. So this, uh, uh, this is a good term for the company because some investors will try to put a, what's called an MFN clause into their shareholder agreements where they try to guarantee that they try to guarantee that if uh, when the company raises another round of investment at presumably better valuation, existing shareholders will have their rights upgraded to match the new investor. This is a never give. I would, uh, I would never uh, agree to this from the startup side. In fact, we want the opposite. We want a pay to play clause, which says that if investors want to get the rights of the next round, they need to, um, they need to join the next round, uh, take up their pro rata share. And we can even make it stronger by saying if investors fail to participate in the next round, uh, often specifically a down round, they might lose some or all of their preference share rights on their existing share class. So uh, I think that's a overview of economic terms. On the control term side, so VC investors will want to have some control over actions that the start that the company management or the board of the company might take after the investment. Why do they want this control? They want this control because when they come into a company, they invest as a minority shareholder and a minority, if they have a board seat, which most VCs will want, they're also going to be a minority on the board. So as a minority shareholder with a minority position uh, and a minority position on the board, the typical case is you have no say in decisions that are made either by the shareholders or by the board. What do I mean? If I'm one director out of five and motions on the board pass with three votes, then the board can do anything it wants, whether I like it or not. If I have 20% of uh, company shares and in the absence of any sort of protection, 80% shareholders can do anything that they want because every shareholder motion, unless it's unanimous, is going to pass with 80% of the votes. So VC investors to protect themselves against um, actions that the company or the board might take that are not in their interest or especially are not consistent with what was agreed in our investment terms, they're going to require uh, both a seat on the board of directors and a set of protected provisions and reserve matters. So when we have a director on our board from an investor, we're also going to, along with that, have a, a series of reserve matters, which are votes that the board might take on actions that will require approval by the investor director. And same thing with protected provisions. This will protect our minority shareholding position. So the protected provisions are going to say that certain actions that the company might take, that the shareholders might take, will require an affirmative vote by the investor shareholder, even though they only have 20%. So those are the two primary control mechanisms that uh, investors will put in place. Another important one is drag along agreement, which helps uh, to ensure investors against a situation where the uh, entrepreneurs or the founders never want to sell the company. So drag along agreement will give investors a right to force a sale of a company of the company, usually after a certain date or above a certain amount of investment. And then conversion enables uh, preference shareholders to convert to ordinary shares in situations where 
this will be required for them to exercise control. So these are the key terms. Now you'll see when you get real investment and shareholder agreements, there'll be many more terms than this, but these are the most important ones to understand. So this is a good place uh, for you to start understanding uh, these key terms. And uh, from there, you can also learn about the less uh, key terms, which also uh, will be included in your investment documents. Okay, so that is the, that brings me to the end of my content for today. I wanna to thank everybody for their kind attention. And I know some of the, the material was a little difficult today because we went into some legal stuff, but uh, I don't expect everybody's gonna understand everything we talked about just based on today's discussion, but this will give you a good starting point to understand what you need to learn more about. Okay, um, so uh, I'm gonna sign off now. I'll stop my screen share and I'm gonna wish everybody a good rest of the day today and a good weekend. We'll be back next week with our uh, final set, my final session in this program, which is gonna be about presenting to investors. So because the, um, because next week present, uh, next week's topic is presenting to investors and because I, uh, everybody has not presented so what I would like, uh, I'm gonna, I'll give you warning now, it won't be something I introduce in the day of the uh, class. So in next week's uh, session, each uh, group will be required to give a one minute pitch of your business idea, just one minute pitch with one slide. So prepare to give a one minute pitch with one slide in our final class next week. And then I'll also, we'll discuss about those pitches and we'll also, I'll talk about how to do a successful investor pitching. Okay, so I look forward to seeing you back here next week and uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, week and weekend and stay safe. Thank you, everybody.